When I was 17 years old, I had to choose the subjects for my study at university. Oh my goodness, I didn't know who I was. And frankly, there was just so much to choose from. I was completely confused. I didn't know where I was going to and what I was going to do. Luckily for me, I had my sister with me, and she knew me pretty well. She said, choose political science, international relations, and, oh yes, let's go for anthropology. Oh my goodness, I don't know what anthropology was. It is a big word, right? But I chose it. And I studied anthropology. Does anyone in the audience know what anthropology is? Is it about feet? No, I've gotten that a long time before, right? Anthropology is about the study of culture. So at university, I studied people and their culture. I studied society. And I studied that very important thing of understanding why people do the things that they do. Eventually, I graduated, and I started teaching myself, shaping those neophyte minds um, and thinking the way that I like to think about things. I taught courses like race, culture, and society, gender and development, even something called anthropology of the body. Yeah, there's something like that. What next? Ten years ago, I found myself at an um, institution, a natural science institution. Suddenly, I'm out of my comfort zone. Oh my goodness, no more social scientists to keep me safe and warm. I was working with chemists, ecologists, mathematicians, ichthyologists. Big words, right? And they challenged me. They asked me that, so what? Why do we need you? Why do we need social scientists? Why do we need to know about people? We're doing it already. We are looking at our environment. Why do we need you? And I needed to show how I can contribute to understanding and helping to find solutions to some of the biggest problems of our time, like climate change, like poverty, like degrading of the environment. So anthropologists have always been interested in the structure and function of society, specifically individuals and the identity. And they teach us that identity consists of something they call identity markers. Your race, your religion, your culture, your language, all of these are identity markers, right? But what happens with these identity markers is that people get so caught up in them, they become binary opposites. Now, there's this famous anthropologist called Claude Lévi-Strauss. He's from France. And he tells us, if we look at food, we can think in terms of binary opposites, either raw or cooked. Okay, so let's take this further. Think of color, white and black. But it's not just color, is it? White can mean purity, black can mean danger, or intensity, there's meaning behind it. Young, old. Young might mean I'm vulnerable, I'm new. Old might mean I have wisdom or knowledge. Or even man, woman. Lots of politics related to that. And now what they say is when we are caught up in these binary uh, oppositions, we find ourselves within identity politics. But people are more and more trying to move closer together. We see this as they're trying to connect with one another. Even researchers are telling us in science that we have to think about our society and our world not as a social system and an ecological system, but as a socio-ecological system. So how can we go forward to solve these problems? I've worked in communities all over the world, but there's one story that has really stayed with me and has changed my, my life forever. 
When I was this young, very naive anthropologist, I went to this chief. And if you've met a chief, you know that they are larger than life. And I said to him, chief, I want to study your community. And I'm so excited, I want to learn about your people. I want to understand why you do the things that you do. And he said, calm down. Let me tell you what you need to do. You need to walk the village. You need to walk the streets of my village and you need to feel the dust between your toes. Only then will you be able to understand my community and the people in my village. Oh wow, what a mind shift walking the village. There's two important things that I learned from this. Number one, and this comes also from anthropology, in that we have to have an emic understanding when we're looking at people and their societies. What is an emic understanding? It's about understanding something from within, using inner logic, understanding it from the in outside, not from the outside in, not using outer lo logic. The second thing that I learned is that we are all implicated with one another. We are all connected in different ways. Okay, so what do I do with that? Well, I think we need to start thinking differently about identities. And I think we need to start talking about decolonization of the I in the I am. Decolonization of the I in the self. What does that mean? Three important things. The first one is to have an awareness and an interrogation of the taken for granted validity of certain types of knowledge. Now there's many different knowledges out there. The one that we all know is Western knowledge. It's fed by scientific knowledge, one and one is two. It's a language, right? But there's other knowledges as well. We know about indigenous knowledge, and we know about local knowledge, for example. But remember, decolonization of the I and the I am does not mean that we disregard everything that has happened before. It means that we're embracing the wide and vast array of options open to us, us to shape the self. Okay, so we've got our knowledge. Secondly, what do we need to think about? Something called polyvocality. Polyvocality meaning multiple voices coming together. Not just one, not just your own, but you taking part in conversations to shape your reality and to shape the conversations that will change your future. What does that mean? It means that you have agency and it means you have the ability to raise your voice, but at the same time to hear what other people are talking about. And the last thing about decolonization of the I in the I am is situatedness. It's an awareness of the now, the being in the present. It is our enmeshed connections with one another. We are unfinished beings if we do not have contextual presence. What does that mean? There's a famous and well-respected anthropologist called Donna Haraway. In 2016, she wrote a book called Keeping with the Trouble. And she says for us to be part of the now, we have to keep with the trouble. It's about being and becoming. Our becoming is about connections. The connections that we make with each other and the strength of those connections. But not just with the connection between you and the person next to you, connections with the earth itself. All critters on earth needs to be connected. Secondly, the being. She says we cannot be a vanishing pivot between a past that may be utopian and a future that may be utopian. We have to be that puzzle piece that slots in between these things. We have to be present. These are important messages, I think, for us to rethink and reshape 
our identities in the now and in the present. It is now 10 years since I met with that chief. And wherever I go, whether it's in the boardroom or the village, I still want to walk the village. I still want to feel the dust between my toes because essentially what we want is to be implicated human beings because solutions to complex problems requires human beings that are implicated with one another and their world. My challenge to you is to become implicated with one another. Become implicated with your world in new and interesting ways. Because then you can answer that question, who am I? <laughs>